Hey there, and welcome to Cyberpunk Librarian. I'm Daniel Messer. We live in a dynamic world where things change at the drop of a digit or the flip of a bit, and our websites reflect that. When you bring up the Cyberpunk Librarian website in your browser, that website doesn't quite exist as you see it when it loads. Now, there's a computer on the back end, and that thing builds the website from templates and PHP code, pulling information and content out of a database. The website kind of doesn't actually exist until you need it to. Now, there are tons of websites like this because the people behind the site want to showcase new things, sell you a new product, deliver a new service, or offer a new convenience. We're wired to respond to the new, and if you're going to change things on the fly, perhaps several times per day or several times per hour. You can't write HTML code that makes that happen, at least not in an effective way. You build a site that builds itself, just like the WordPress engine powering Cyberpunk Librarian. While the computing cost of building the Cyberpunk Librarian website is pretty minuscule, it adds up over time. But think of the computing cost of building Amazon.com day after day, for hundreds of millions of customers, month after month, year after year. The energy needed to build a massive, highly trafficked website, well, that needs to come from somewhere. While you might scoff at the idea of data centers and their role in global warming, the truth is that data centers account for 2% of the world's overall energy usage. And they emit as much carbon dioxide as the entire airline industry. Oh, and, uh, Estimates are that that percentage could rise to 8% in the next 10 years. So, if you're looking to set up a website, I have some options for you. And one of them is a pretty nifty option at that. And while using these options may feel like buying a hybrid vehicle when you're surrounded by semi-trucks, well, you're still doing your part to reduce energy usage and carbon emissions. But if the environmental cost isn't quite as important to you, well... Static website generators are delightfully geeky and a whole lot of fun. This is Cyberpunk Librarian, episode 58, Static Not Stagnant. I'm Daniel Messer, your friendly neighborhood cyberpunk librarian. Welcome you back, back to the return of the show that explores the intersection of libraries and technology and is all about living that high-tech, low-budget lifestyle. Hey there, ladies and gentlemen, and genders outside and in between. It has been a long damn time, but Cyberpunk Librarian is back with a new episode, a new focus, and hopefully a little stability to follow. If you're wondering where I've been the last year or so, well, you know, let's, uh, let's take a few minutes to catch up, shall we? In the last year or so, there have been some big changes for me and my family. We wound up moving to Kentucky from Arizona uh, when my wife received a pretty stellar promotion at her job. The biggest problem is that uh, she had a great job waiting for her in the Bowling Green area of Kentucky, and um, I didn't. So I went into a massive, frantic, job-searching mode where all the while dealing with a huge project at my current job at the time. What massive projects? Well, my former library workplace went fine free in the early part of 2019. And that means that this library no longer charges overdue fines. It's absolutely brilliant. It's a movement that's literally sweeping the nation, library after library. The overdue fines are falling because it's about time these libraries realized that all overdue fines do is push away the people who can't afford them. And beloved, for the people that can't afford an overdue fine, those are the people who need the library the most. So that is awesome. They got rid of the overdue fines, but it did mean that we would have to modify the library software system, commonly called an integrated library system, uh, to no longer charge fines, you know? So, um, that wasn't too bad, but the biggest task facing me was waiving well over a million U.S. dollars on tens of thousands of patron accounts. The problem is, at the time, the ILS vendor 
would have charged the library quite a bit of money to make that happen automatically. So I uh, coded around it. I wrote a little program called Stooge that automated the waiving of fines through Polaris Leap. Now, why Stooge? Well, because at the beginning of this whole project, I had the idea to start with three machines, each running an instance of Stooge. These machines were called Mo, Larry, and Curly. However, when it became obvious that three machines weren't going to be enough, I enlisted some help, and by the time I was done, I had Stooge bots running on nine machines, two of them virtual, and one of those VMs was being accessed through my iPad Pro. It was a crazy couple of weeks. I mean, it was insane. But by God, I got that job done for the low, low cost of an existing laptop lab, two VMs, and free software. From what I've heard, a couple of other libraries wound up using my silly little Stooge app to, uh, to go find free as well, which makes me so happy. I mean, it, it's always nice to, you know, figure out how to solve a problem. But when another library or another person or whatever uses that solution too, it kind of makes you think you did something right. So that, that made me feel good. So soon after I finished up the find free work and the cleanup from that project, I found a job at a private library company and even better, I would be able to work remotely from my home office. So awesome score. That was great. You have no idea how many problems that solved. As things went along with the timeline for our move, selling the house, starting new jobs, finishing things in Arizona, I wound up resigning from my current job and leaving on a Friday and started my new job the following Monday. Oh, and we left Arizona four days later, driving a Jeep Renegade and a 24-foot Penske moving truck. So after three days and two nights on the road, we arrived in Bowling Green, Kentucky on a Sunday evening. Spent one night in a hotel, moved into the house on Monday morning, and then the next day I caught a plane out of Nashville to fly to California for my first meeting with my new team. It's been a crazy 2019, Miss Honey, and I don't think I'm going to miss that. <laughs> I, I had a lot of fun, but it was, it was just insanity. So now that the holidays are behind us, a new year is upon us, some stability has returned to my life. I'm no longer winded when I get out of bed. I, you know, I feel somewhat rested. And I can get back on top of a keyboard and back in front of a microphone. So, Happy New Year, beloved. Let's get geeky. When I finally had some time to do some typing, I wanted to start a new personal blog. Something that wasn't fully dedicated to technology or libraries, but something that was dedicated to things going on in my life and in my new home. Thing is, is I didn't want to set up another WordPress site just for that. Nor did I want something that was complex content management system or something like that for a website that would mostly be images and text. So I started casting around for ideas. I had a few requirements, but I wanted to meet most of them. I wanted something that was easy to manage. It needed an RSS feed. It needed to look decent. And I didn't want to manage another database or backend or anything like that. That's when I happened across an article about static site generators. So, static site generators are a sort of new wave, old school way to create and manage a website. Rather than worry about a MariaDB backend, a rendering engine written in PHP, JavaScript, or something like that, I wanted something that got out of my way and let me write a thing and maybe add some photos or whatever, push a button, and spit out a blog with a new blog post. That, that's all I wanted. Static site generators can make this happen through a variety of ways, but the upside is that a static site generator produces static pages, hence the name. So you'll find yourself in possession of a website made from HTML files with, you know, maybe some JavaScript and CSS, but no need for a backend server. There's no database driving the whole thing. That's right, my friend, a website made from HTML files. 
Good old fashioned zippity doo dah, easy to read, quick to load, even faster to render, don't need to be built, old school, tried and true, Pepperidge Farm remembers text files written in hypertext markup language. You know, the way things used to work. And the thing is, because these are static pages, just sitting on a server, waiting to be served, that means this website will move fast. Nothing loads faster than text, and you'll see that a static website can be one of the fastest things around on a web slowed down by dynamic generation, databases, too much JavaScript, too many ads, far too many ads, and way too much JavaScript. Now, static website generators, they're not completely new thing. Back in the day, uh, the day being the early 2000s, there was a fantastic bit of software called Easy Blogs. It was a simple, easy to use blogging system that gave you a few windows to write in, add images, you could maybe add some tags, set up a few options, and you know, that, that's it. You'd write your blog in a window that looked almost exactly like anything you'd see in modern WordPress, Tumblr, Ghost, or any one of those big content management systems. So it's got, you know, the buttons for bolding and italicized and adding an image and stuff like that. Very wisey wig. What you see is what you get. And you do your thing. And once you were ready, you click the publish button and easy blogs would roll through your files, pick up your preferences, take your content and generate a website for you. You'd put this website online and you'd upload the files with probably something like an FTP program. Every time you published a new post, you'd get some new files to go with your existing ones, and Easy Blogs would update the necessary files to reflect the new content. It even generated an RSS feed for your subscribers. It was beautiful. It was really nice. So, when I started casting around for a static site generator, I had Easy Blogs on my mind. It was actually a joy to use because it offered a functional interface that, for the most part, got out of your way and just let you write. So I wanted to find something like that, something that was easy to use and let me handle a blog without handling a website, you know? Now, before I get into what I chose, I'll tell you, you have a lot of options if you're looking for a static site generating solution for all your website needs. Each is a little different in how they work, the languages they use, and the functionality they provide. So let's do a quick rundown. Let's talk about some of the popular ones before we get to the one I actually wound up using. So first, there's Jekyll, spelled the same way as the character from Dr. Jekyll and Mr. Hyde, J-E-K-Y-L-L. This is probably the most popular static site generator. If it's not, it's, it's got to be top two. It was originally developed by Tom Preston Warner, co-founder of GitHub, so no surprises. It's used to power a lot of projects and development websites on GitHub. It's written in Ruby, and it works through, uh, works through content written in Markdown. That's another thing. A lot of these static site generators work with Markdown formatted content. So if you know any Markdown and you like writing in Markdown, static site generators are pretty cool. No plugins needed. No, no nothing for that. If you like writing in Markdown, almost all of them support that. So, yeah, Jekyll is a... Uh, Jekyll's pretty big on the scene. You will easily find tons of pages. I would not be surprised if you've looked at a website delivered by Jekyll and didn't even know it. So, but if you're not into, if you're not into that, you might check out Hexo. Now, Hexo is powered by Node.js, and Hexo is geared towards blogging websites and offers plenty of options for themes. If you're at all familiar with the Node Package Manager NPM, you can have a Hexo site running in minutes. It's very quick to set up if, if you kind of know what you're doing. Now, Hugo, as the name suggests, is written in Go. See? Hugo. Ha ha. Its popularity is likely second only to Jekyll. And it is built for speed, man. And I don't mean loading speed in your browser. I mean actually building the site for you. If you have a lot of pages, say 1,000, 2,000, and you're using Jekyll, it can take a bit of time to build the site every time you want to make some changes. With Hugo, you can run your build, thousands of pages, it'll take seconds. It's very, very fast. 
And there are plenty more options than those besides. I mean, I will uh, I will put some stuff in the show notes, so check those show notes uh, in your podcatcher or at cyberpunklibrarian.com slash podcast. There'll be a couple of articles and various solutions there for your static website dreams. I mean, you don't have to go with what I went with. Um, so, you know, ch check out your options. I mean, they're, almost all of them are free. I can't think of a paid one. They're almost all free and open source. So pretty cool. You can give them all a shot for all I care and have a good time. But the thing is, the thing is, um, most of these static site generators, they, they just weren't for me. Sure, I could use them, and I tried about five different things before landing on a kit that worked the way I wanted and did the things I needed. The biggest problem with all of these solutions is that they're all seriously freaking involved. Almost everything is done on a command line, and if you're new to the system, you're going to find yourself spending a decent amount of time reading documentation and wandering the plastic hallways of Stack Exchange. Now, I'm sorry, I, I just, for this project, I don't have time for that crap. I wanted something graphic, clickable, functional, pretty. D dare I say pretty? I know command line programs can be pretty, but they're not as pretty as something that's got a really decent clickable interface. I mean, that's just my personal preference. You do you. Sure, I can, I can rock a command line, and I'm perfectly comfortable working in a black screen with a green flashing cursor and green text, because that's how you set up your terminal window, unless you're, unless you're a monster or something. But the thing is, I didn't want any of that. I wanted easy and light, because I'm lazy, and it's a blog, not a job. So, after a bit of searching, I found exactly what I was after. And I can't wait to tell you about it. You know what I like? I like open source software. And you know what I like even more than that? I like cross-platform software. You know, the kind of software that works on Mac, Windows, and Linux, all the great operating systems. And you know what's even better than both of those things? Cross-platform open source software that's pretty and easy to use. So, let me tell you about Publi. Publi is a fantastic open source project that invokes the same feeling Easy Blogs did for me. When I first downloaded it and opened it up, I was kind of taken back to the halcyon days of the early 2000s. The initial contact with the app presents a friendly, colorful dialogue that asks you to create a new website. Yeah, that's, that's, that's what I want to do, and I just type, type words into, into fields and forms? Well, I can do that. It'll offer you a space for the website's name and the primary author, which can be your name or a pseudonym or however you want to do that. And you can give it a color code and a glyph. Oh yes, uh, did I mention that Publi can handle multiple websites? You can manage and create content for several different websites, each with their own settings. But let's not worry about that for now. We're just looking to create a decent blog for the time being. Okay, so the glyph and the color don't really mean anything in the context of your site as it appears on the web. It's simply there to help you tell the difference between multiple sites at a glance, which it does very well. After you get your basic site information going, you're taken to an admin system that is clear and intuitive. Pop down to the settings menu first for all kinds of options, but the most visual and probably the most important will have to do with your theme. Publi has several free themes and some premium options as well. Prices are running around 24 euros as of this recording, which isn't too bad, really. But the free themes are lovely, and they're easy to install. So each theme has its own options, and once you install one and activate it, you'll want to pop up to the themes menu, and you'll set the theme options there. There's nothing particularly groundbreaking about the layout or the options available in this program, and anyone that's familiar with a WordPress-style content management system 
will find themselves right at home in the Publi interface. Right then, so okay, let's um, let's write a post, shall we? Well, look at that. The text editor is almost exactly the same thing as a classic WordPress editor, which is like dozens of other editor UIs across the web. If you've seen one, you've seen this one, and you're going to be fine. If I have a complaint, it's that there's nothing in the way of a spell check, or if there is, I haven't found a way to turn it on. So I find myself either checking the post several times for a spelling because, oh boy, yeah, I, uh, I, I'm a decent writer, sometimes I'm a decent speller, but I'm rarely both at the same time. Um, so I'll write the, you know, I'll check the post several times over, or more likely, I'll write the post in Typora and then paste that into the Publi editor. That, that's not a big problem for me, especially since I write a lot of stuff in Typora. It's my word processor of choice, really. Hell, I wrote the notes for this show in Typora. But there it might be a thing that changes your workflow if you're not used to doing that. So, Publi offers all the bells and whistles you'd want from a simple and elegant blogging software. Custom menus, multiple authors, tags, and so on. Oh, and... Well, most static website generators don't have like a search function built in. It's hard to have search when you have no database to search. Publi offers you the ability to use the Google API to basically set up a site-specific search for your blog site. So it works pretty well. It, it's kind of a, uh, it takes a little setup, but once it's done, it kind of makes sense with what you get and what it shows. So yeah, look, look into the documentation. It's, you know, you, you'll have it set up and running pretty quickly. But okay, so all of that, all of that is great, but how, how do you get the stuff on the web? Well, once again, you have a slew of options. You can choose from setting up a classic FTP or SFTP connection, which, you know, that's actually what I do. It's, it's plain, it's simple, it's easy, it works. But you can also use Amazon Web Services. You can use GitHub Pages, GitLab, uh, Netlify, Google Cloud, or... You can actually publish the thing to a zip file that's just as portable as any other zip file. Personally, I use FTP, like I said, uh, which I set up with a user and pass on my web host. When I hit my button to sync those changes to my online site, Publi builds all the files, updates whatever needs the updating, hooks up to my website via FTP and logs in, and then it uploads the new files and overwrites the old ones as needed. In seconds... I've published my blog posts with ease. I mean, sure, Publi probably isn't as fast as Hugo. As a matter of fact, I know it's not. But I'm not looking for that kind of speed. I'm looking for the ease of use and honestly, the joy of using something simple to create a blog. If it takes a few seconds to build the site, I don't care. I'm blogging. I'm usually not in a hurry. But... If there is a downside for some people, it's that Publi is written in Node.js and Vue.js, and it runs as an Electron application. Oh, so for those who don't know, Electron is basically a set of tools that lets a developer create a browser-based application using common web tech like HTML, JavaScript, and CSS. Their app, however, will run like and look like a more native application. They can bundle all their code, their scripts, their images, their pages together in a package that conveniently includes the browser to run it on. It, it opens up desktop development to people like me who are primarily web developers, and while I have developed desktop apps, they are nothing as fancy as some of the stuff I've put online. So, yeah, it, it, it's kind of cool. Until you think about the fact that every Electron app has a browser running underneath it. Imagine a fairly common scenario where maybe you're working in Publi. You, you took my advice and you, you got Publi and you went and got Typora too. So you could write the post in an app that has a spell check. You're talking to friends on Slack and just kind of keeping, keeping in touch there. Oh, and you're expecting a call from a friend later on, so Skype is sitting over there in the corner, too. You're just waiting for that, you know, trademark tone to go off and so you can pick up your Skype phone. And maybe you're working on a bit of coding in Visual Studio Code, and that's open somewhere in the background. 
Oh, and you needed a browser, so you're running Chrome. Actually, uh, you're running Chrome six times because Chromium is the underlying browser that powers an Electron app. And Publi, Typora, Slack, Skype, and Visual Studio Code, all of them are Electron apps. Chromium, like Chrome, can be a resource hog. So the fact that you've essentially got six Chrome browsers running, well, that might bog down your system a bit depending on your RAM specs. Which is why Electron occasionally gets a bad rap for its memory usage. Now, I don't have a problem with it, but I rarely run that many Electron apps at a single time. But it's something that you might want to keep in mind and be aware of. So, okay, enough talking for now. It's time to do some writing. And it just so happens that I have an idea for a blog post. And that about wraps up this episode of Cyberpunk Librarian. I thank you so much for tuning in and hope you, you know, hope you didn't delete that that show in your podcatcher. And, you know, if you did and you're back, hey, thank you for coming back. And if you didn't, well, thanks for taking a notice and picking the show up again. There are going to be more episodes to follow now that I've got some stability back in the life. And uh, believe me, I've got some things to talk about. You're going to be hearing some uh, some new ideas, some new topics with a new focus and uh, a little bit more cyberpunk than it has been, as a matter of fact. And you'll see what I mean as we go along. So uh, you can find the show notes for this episode and all the other episodes before it at cyberpunklibrarian.com slash podcast. The song that you're currently digging on is, well, I might screw this up, but it's called Your to Folly. If I, uh, if I pronounce that right, I'm going to say Your to Folly by Auditive Escape. There'll be links in the show notes to pick up that song and the other songs that you heard during the podcast, which were Fluvial Aspen and Epsilon, both from Auditive Escape. I happened across those, uh, happened across this music project on the web a while back. It's like, oh, I must, I must have that. So yeah, check out those links. Go, uh, go take a look for more of their stuff because fantastic work. Cyberpunk Librarian would like to thank the Internet Archive at archive.org for all of the work that they do uh, saving and archiving the web, but also hosting the Cyberpunk Librarian podcast. All of my uh, all of my podcasts go up on the archive for uh, for a couple of reasons. Number one, they're on the archive, and I think that's pretty nifty. And number two, that is where they are hosted. So big shout out to the Internet Archive doing some incredibly important work so if you've uh, if you've not been over to the archive recently you gotta go check it out um i think i might start a thing up here at some point where i kind of point out something cool you know something specific and cool at the archive but for now you can find radio programs more podcasts video games you can play video games on your browser at the archive it's, it's just amazing stuff so go check them out archive.org thanks again to the internet archive and if you want to get in touch with me, I highly suggest you do so. You can uh, you can find me in several places these days. I am still on the Twitters. Uh, maybe not as much as I used to be because Twitter is just turning into a massive tire fire. But I am still there and I will still respond to you. I am at Vibrarian on the Twitter. That is B-I-B-R-A-R-I-A-N. It's like librarian, but it starts with a B. And you can also find me on a federated Mastodon instance. I am at Glamorous. That's G-L-A-M-M-R dot U-S. You will find me at Cyberpunk at Glamorous. Um, you can uh, subscribe to me there. You can uh, you know check out the federated Mastodon systems. Those are really cool. So uh, check that out. If you're not uh, if you not looked at the Mastodon instance, I think you might like it, especially if you like Twitter. And hey, it's decentralized, it's federated, and it's not Twitter. That's pretty cool in and of itself. And if you, if you like the old uh, tried-and-true SMTP methods, you can always reach me at cyberpunklibrarian at protonmail.com. I would love to hear from you. So, it's about time to get out of here and get you back to your regularly scheduled day, now already in progress. Once again, thanks so much for listening. Check out the music, check out the show notes. But remember, at the very least, remember that you don't have to live high-tech to be low-budget, but it certainly helps if you're a cyberpunk. I'll see you on the other side. Take care, beloved.